Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Ranking Member Meeks. Uh, my background, and, and thank you for the subcommittee. My background, as you mentioned, Mr. Chairman, is uh, international investing. I went to work for the great John Templeton in 1990. Sir John Templeton truly pioneered global investing. He was a brilliant man. And I remember well work with him, being with him, when the wall was coming down in Berlin. And uh, we looked at that, and I said, so where do you think the best place to invest would be? Should we invest in Russia? And he said, no, we should invest in China. And the reason that he said that was he said the Chinese will remember how markets operate, and they will be able to effectively operate in markets. The Russians, on the other hand, uh, were so far from a market economy that it would be a long learning process before they'd be successful. Now, I thought that was interesting because at the time, in 1990, uh, the Russian, the Soviet Union economy was number three in the world, uh, second to the United States, um, and the Chinese economy wasn't ranked in the top ten. Now we are here just three decades later, less than three decades later, and China's economy is, by some measures, the largest in the world, if you follow purchasing power parity, and it is clearly at least second to ours. So I understand global investments uh, from the financial markets perspective and what Sir John Templeton taught me, but I also have studied economic warfare, and in 2008 I was hired by the SOLIC group in the Pentagon, Special Operations Low Intensity Conflict, to study irregular warfare and the role that economic warfare may have played in the 2008 financial collapse. I believe it's necessary that we both have an understanding of global investing and economic <coughs> warfare if you want to understand why and how of Chinese investing. Uh, I want you to clearly understand that unlike Sir John Templeton, whose primary purpose in making an investment was the return to the investor, Chinese investments are not made with economic purposes. Certainly that they're a consideration, but they're not the primary consideration. This is true for not only China, but all sovereign wealth funds. There is a national interest whenever a sovereign wealth fund invests, but it's particularly true for the Chinese. It's also true for any Chinese individual investors who are scrutinized by the government for their investments, as well as any companies in China, which are many, in many cases, largely controlled by the People's Liberation Army or the state. Uh, president Xi has announced himself president for life, essentially, and he's been jailing rivals. And what we see as a marketplace, our enemies view as a battle space. And I believe that's particularly true with the Chinese. One of the books that I've closely studied is a book titled Unrestricted Warfare. It was published in 1999 by two senior colonels of the People's Liberation Army. And it outlines a series of efforts, including hacking, influence operations, uh, intellectual property theft, infiltration of leadership, currency warfare, and it alludes to things like the Confucius Institutes and the mass uh, push of Chinese students into our colleges and universities, all of which are soft means of warfare. I would suggest to this committee that Chinese investments must be deemed, must be seen from that perspective. I believe that this is a part, and, and uh, my colleagues mentioned the Made in China 2025 policy, which is designed to have uh, Chinese, China self-sufficient in, in certain industries and areas. I believe that that, it too, is a form of economic warfare, and I believe all of this fits with a part of the 100-year marathon. I brought a book from my friend uh, Mike Pillsbury who wrote about the 100-year marathon, and I would point you to the fact that in 1949, uh, the People's Republic of China was formed, and 100 years from that period would be 2049. This is an important date to recognize because the Chinese have learned from the Tiananmen Square incident in, in 1989 that 20 years later they were able to host the Olympics in Beijing. So the belief, as I understand it in China, is that within two decades the, you can remove a massacre and a horrific event from the world's consciousness and memory. Therefore, if the goal is to have uh, essentially the largest economy and the most powerful position in the world by 2049, the idea would be that you have to be completed with your horrific activity by the year 2029. So I would suggest that over the next decade, we will see a more aggressive China than we have seen in the past. We're already beginning to see this. I was reading some Australian press reports complaining about 
the uh, nations around Australia feeling Chinese influence following the acceptance of Chinese investments. And the Australians were wondering, why are they no longer our friends? Why have they become more China's friends? I would also point to the effort starting in 2013 where the Chinese talked about de-Americanizing the world, removing the dollar as the world's primary reserve currency. And we've seen an increased step up in aggressive behavior since that date. I would point to recent press reports where something as simple as T-shirts sold at the Gap were questioned by China and therefore polled because they happened to mention Tibet or Taiwan. And a Canada Air travel magazine was recently polled because Canada Air was told it is unacceptable to show Taiwan on a map in your travel magazine when you're flying. I wanted to suggest, therefore, that the Chinese view this as wholly economic warfare. Every investment that they make is, is uh, viewed from that perspective. And we, unfortunately, as Americans, tend to view investments purely from an economic perspective. We must change that. We must reconnect the idea of national security and economics. They have been separated since the Clinton administration. When the wall fell in, in Berlin, it, our nation said we have the most dominant military on the planet and we have the strongest economy, and we said go for it. And in both cases, we, we pursued military and economic goals, but they were no longer connected, which is a tremendous disservice to our national policy. We must reconnect it. We must realize China is more, more than a competitor. They're clearly an adversary. We must do things like strengthen uh, CFIUS, the Committee on Foreign Investment in the United States. Uh, we must look beyond the political narrative, Democrat, Republican, left, right, and recognize that China is truly an adversary, and we must carefully prepare for it. Uh, we have largely ignored uh, most of the economic warfare attacks, many of the things that I reported to the Pentagon in 2008, including the fact that Russia undertook what's known as a bear rate attack on our economy in the summer of 2008, timed to disrupt our election. I hear lots of discussion about Russia's involvement in the election of 2016, but when I was warning this Congress and the Pentagon and the FBI and, and the Defense Intelligence Agency and others that Russia was heavily involved in disrupting our economy just prior to election, most of my concerns uh, were overlooked because, well, we don't really think in those terms. We must think in those terms if we're going to succeed for as a nation for the next several decades. And so with that, I say thank you for the opportunity to be here.